a loophole where Congress can put limitations on who the president can or can't remove from the executive branch. Huh. Stay with me, folks, and I'll explain it all. Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthification Chronicles, and the Supreme Court had quite a case on March 3rd, and I just had a chance to go over it because they didn't have the audio up until today, and I really wanted to hear the audio because I had heard that there were some discussions going back and forth, and I wanted to hear the tone of voice that the people had. So let's get at it, because I think this is one case that may kind of kick off a series of cases that will lead to freeing the presidency from what Congress has really been doing with it. So let's get into this. SCOTUS had this one case that they heard, like I said, on March 3rd, and it had to do with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Now we talked about that in a previous video, but I wanted to get more into it and it just took a while for me to actually go through everything. So let's look at what this was. The entire case was Celia Law uh, versus Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That was the actual case. But the oddity about it is it's not really about the case. I mean, it is kind of, but it's not, I, yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll try to explain this if I can. Anyway, uh, what they were talking about is whether this particular bureau is constitutional, and that was at the heart of it. There's a lot more to it, though, as it goes through, and so what they're talking about here is at issue in the case is whether the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act's vesting of substantial executive authority in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, an independent agency led by a single director, violates the separation of powers, and two, whether if the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is found unconstitutional on the basis of the separation of powers, the portion of the Dodd-Frank Act that established the agency can be severed from the rest of that statute. Okay, so there were really two basic questions that they were dealing with here. And, you know, the second one hinges on the first. So, yes, there was a lot of discussion going back and forth. And so what they're trying to figure out, if you look at this, is it says the powers and independence given to the director of the CFPB under the Dodd-Frank Act are extraordinary. Once appointed by the president to a five-year term and confirmed by the Senate, the director cannot be fired by the president unless it is, quote, for cause, meaning that the director could not be removed for pursuing policies counter to the president's agenda. Okay, now think about that for a minute. What if, you know, you get into office as the president and the guy before you, the year before you were elected, they put in this person? your entire term, that person's going to be in charge of that bureau because you can't fire them unless you have a darn good reason. And probably if it's President Trump, you'd have to prove it in court. Fortunately, right now, the one that is in there right now is a woman who Trump appointed and she actually, I think, is doing a good job. So I don't think there's any problems with her per se. It's just the concept of what has been going on. Now, as this says, a ruling is expected by June of 2020, which could place the issue at the center of the presidential election. Not so much anymore since Elizabeth Warren is no longer running. But this agency was the brainchild of Elizabeth Warren. And so here's the deal. As I'm understanding it, and granted, there were a lot of times in this discussion that it was like, okay, that went over my head. <laughs> By the time I got done, it was like, I'm not sure I have enough brain cells to be able to even listen to this entire thing. No, they're very smart people, okay, that argued this, and I'm not one of them. <laughs> uh, there's a reason probably why I'm not a lawyer. But, uh, yeah, I need a little bit more on the ball for that. It's just a lot of legal terms and a lot of cases that I didn't know. And I suppose if I studied them, you know, I could figure it out. But the deal is, as I understand it, 
that we have three branches. You know, you, you understand that. We have the executive, we have the legislative, and we have the judiciary. We, okay, you're clear on that. Now, the executive, technically speaking, is a unitary executive, which means we have one person who should be in charge of everything in the executive. Well, over the years, Congress has done an end run around this. And how did they do it? Well, they went through and created these agencies in the executive branch. And then they said they wanted to um, insulate them against politics. So they made them somewhat independent of the presidency. Okay? They set it up so the president cannot remove these people at will. You remember the whole big hullabaloo over President Trump removing Marie Yovanovitch, okay, from Ukraine the, as the ambassador from Ukraine? All right. Well, he has the power to remove ambassadors at will. That means that he can take them out at any time for any reason. So any ambassador can be removed at any time for any reason. The president can remove them at will. Many people in the executive can be removed at will, but Congress has created a lot of positions in the executive through their little laws and stuff that they've voted in that are not under the president's control and he cannot fire people or remove them at will. He can only remove them for cause if he has a very good reason. Well, you know how litigious these Democrats have been against this president. It wouldn't matter why he'd remove somebody. They're going to take him to court if he does because they're going to claim it was not for the, a good enough cause. And that was a big part of the discussion that they had going on. What would be the line that you draw? I mean, exactly what would be good cause and what wouldn't? Is policy, you know, if they're not supporting the president's policy, is that a good cause? Well, some said yes, some said no. They had, um, there was what, three people, four people, I believe, that argued. And uh, so they were, you know, kind of going back and forth. Some said yes, some said no. And because of the questioning, I mean, the questioning did get a little heated at times from the justices. And if you listen to it all, I think it would be very difficult to determine how the ruling's going to go. At least for me, I, I'm i sitting there going, I don't know how they're going to rule. I really don't. I'm not sure many of them know at this point. They seemed even confused about the question that was being asked. And it does bring up a lot of stuff. There was a lot of debate, too, between whether it was... Um, the problem was that this particular agency has one person who is in power and, like I said, cannot be removed at will. They can only be removed for good cause. And the president, the president can remove them, but only for good cause. And again, he would probably have to <laughs> prove that in court, and especially right now with all the Democrats the way they are. But, um, and it's a five-year term, which also causes some problems as well, because like I said, it could work out, it didn't with Trump, obviously, but it could work out that you would have somebody in there, the entire presidency for someone. And it's really not fair because it'd be somebody pointed from the previous administration. And you know how that works out a lot of times. So anyway, um... This article goes on. This uh, is a pretty decent article here that kind of gives a summary of it. But, but this, from, this is from the SCOTUS blog, and she writes, The dispute is not merely an academic one. If the justices agree that the restrictions violate the doctrine known as the separation of powers, the idea that the Constitution divides the different functions of government among the executive, judicial, and legislative branches... Their ruling could potentially unravel all the CFPB's decisions in the nine years since its creation. So see, there's a lot to it that could, you know, kind of be dominoes falling if they make this decision. Like I said, the woman that's in there now, she's decent because Trump appointed her and she seems to be doing a good job. But the one before this was not a good guy. 
And I think he was in there until sometime in 2017 when he stepped down for something. So uh, on his own accord, he would have been in there longer if he wouldn't have um, stepped down. He, he, there was something else he wanted to do. I can't remember what it was right now. Anyway, so um, the case now before the court was filed by the CELA law, a law firm that provides, according to its briefs, quote, a variety of legal services to consumers, including assistance with the resolution of consumer debt. When the CFPB began an investigation into whether CELA had violated federal telemarketing laws, it sought information and documents from the firm. CELA objected to the request. It argued that the structure of the CFPB is unconstitutional because the Bureau is headed by a single director who has significant power but can only be removed by the president for cause. That is, for a very good reason. So, see, it really was about an accusation that they violated telemarketing laws. How it got to this is like, okay, this is not at all what's being argued. The argument had nothing to do with telemarketing at all. What it had to do with is this whole idea, is this structure of this CFPB, is it unconstitutional because of the single director? And like I said, then the argument got into whether it made a difference, whether it was a single person or if it was multiple people. And oh, it just went back and forth. And this is what it says here. Although the director can only be removed for cause, the Court of Appeals reasoned that restriction does not, quote, impede the president's ability to perform his constitutional duty to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed. And so what they were trying to say is that if uh, the president said, well, they're, the decisions they're making are causing problems with the national security or some other thing that he is definitely responsible for, then he could remove the person for cause. But it sounded to me through the arguments that it was going to be mighty hard to remove this person if he had to. Now, obviously, like I said, as far as I can tell, I checked her out. I didn't see anything negative about her. I've seen a lot of positive reports. Uh, she did have a couple of times that she went in and appeared in front of the oversight committee, but I didn't listen to those, um, you know, discussions, the hearings, but I haven't seen a lot of negativity about her. So I think she is doing a good job. Um, here's her name, Kathy Craninger. So uh, this is what it's all about. And of course, you know, Senator Warren saying, of course it's constitutional. Oh, yes. But I think from what I saw out of all of this, it just seems to me like there is this concerted effort by Congress to make laws to tie the hands of the president. Remember, I've told you for a long time that this is really all about Congress trying to usurp the power of the executive branch and especially of the president since he is supposed to be the top dog there and he's supposed to really be in control of everything in the executive branch. But yet Congress is the one that makes the laws about what agencies exist. So you see where I think there's a conflict uh, I'm not sure. I mean, they weren't really bringing that out, but it just seemed a little odd. Yeah, see, she was confirmed by the Senate in December 2018, and Mick Mulvaney was in there for a while. I mean, he was the acting director. He, Mick Mulvaney has made the rounds, folks. He's been in a lot of positions, actually. So, uh, kind of interesting. And now I hear, what, they're putting Mark Meadows in there as chief of staff? That's going to be interesting. Good for Mark, but we're losing all our big fighters in the, you know, in the House of Representatives. Anyway, so you can go ahead and read this. I, I just think that it is, um, you know, a good overview of what was going on and about the structure. The thing is, if this particular agency, the CFPB, is ruled unconstitutional, if its structure is unconstitutional, then it's going to open the door for what about some of these others? And especially like the Fed. I mean, if you think five years for this one person would be something, you know, the Fed, they're in there for what, 14 years? Hmm, <laughs> long time. So uh, that would be something else. And so I've got this article that if you want to read it, 
As always, I leave all the links down below in the description. You know, click something to pop that description open, a little triangle or the show more or something like that to get it to open up, but they'll all be down there. So I have this article and then here's the article by Amy Howe and she put this out on the 25th of February. It's, it's a little more legalese than the Breitbart article. So it, it says here, and this is where it is, you know, the question came to the justices last year after the CFPB initiated an investigation into whether CELA Law, a California-based law firm that provides debt relief services to consumers, violated telemarketing sales rules. And again, when CELA Law declined to respond fully to the CFPB's request for information and documents, the agency went to federal court in California to enforce the request. CELA Law responded by challenging the CFPB's authority to issue the request. See, this is how it got there. The law firm argued that the CFPB's structure is unconstitutional because the Bureau is headed by only one director who wields significant power but can only be removed for cause rather than at will. That is for any reason. And so, yeah, this goes on. And again, it is a little more legalese, but they give you links to these others. This one was mentioned an awful lot. The Ninth Circuit pointed to a 1935 Supreme Court decision called Humphrey's Executor v. United States. And you can click on that and you can see about it. It's, um, here's the case. And again, it was in 1935. So it's been a while, right? But this was... Uh, when Congress provides for the appointment of officers whose functions, like those of the federal trade commissioners, are of legislative and judicial quality rather than executive and limits the grounds upon which they may be removed from office, the president has no constitutional power to remove them for reasons other than those so specified. So here is the deal. See, like I said, Congress is the one that created this agency in the first place, The a, a lot of these agencies. And they're the ones that stipulate whether the president can remove someone at will or for cause. So you see where I'm saying they're taking away part of the power of the president? It's how they've been able to do that over the years that they just, you know, they create these agencies and it's kind of like a back door to tie the president's hands by putting in all these deep state players. So, yeah. This has been going on for years. This was 1935 here, folks. 1935. It was referred to an awful lot. <laughs> it was mentioned many times. Anyway, I just want to remind you of how you can go through this yourself if you want to. The oral arguments, you can always find them on the SCOTUS website. You can find the oral arguments, uh, either argument transcripts or the audio. And uh, they usually last about an hour and a half. This one lasted an hour and 14 minutes. And you can even download them if you want to. And you can play them right here if you just want to do that. What I like to do is set that up in one tab and then put bring up the transcript in the other tab. And this is the transcript of it. And so you can just go through as they they talk. You've got it right here. You can follow the whole thing. you kind of got to go past the first couple pages. These are the lawyers that will be talking. And you can kind of look on behalf of the petitioner. Uh, and this is Noel Francisco. We've talked about him before. And he was for the Department of Justice, which was really, it, it was really strange because it almost seemed like they were arguing the same position, that they were both saying that, you know, it's unconstitutional. I, I don't know. It was really kind of strange. And then they had this guy who was a court-appointed amicus curiae, and that's a friend of the court, that's what that means, in support of the judgment. And then they had this one who was representing the House of Representatives as amicus curiae. Okay, and then it goes down here and it starts in and you can just follow along. I mean, you put the, well, you got to get past this part right here. This, this is nice because it tells you what page you can go to and all the lines are numbered. So, uh, yeah, here's where it starts. It started at 10.09 a.m. and you can go through and you can read that you can um, follow along like i said i like to put the oral on one side one tab and just start it running and then just follow along that way so yeah it was uh, it was interesting then uh this was another one from the scotus blog this was a view from the courtroom violent agreement that actually was a term that was used 
because they were in agreement. Like I said, it was it was really strange. It's like normally you expect one side to be holding one position and another side to hold the other position. It was almost like they they both agreed that it was not constitutional. It, it was weird. Um, so anyway, you can go through and read this. He talks about it, um, you know, in more terms of like, this is what it was like inside the court. Of course, there are no cameras, so they have this drawings. Here's something that I thought was kind of interesting. In the VIP section to the right of the bench, Maureen Scalia, the widow of the late Justice Antonin Scalia, arrives with her son, John, a lawyer in private practice. Marcia Coyle reported in the National Law Journal earlier this week that Mrs. Scalia would be making her first visit to the courtroom for an argument since her husband's death in 2016, apparently because three former Scalia clerks will be among the four lawyers arguing the Sela Law this morning. Uh, and then he talks about it later on. And it's really kind of interesting. Uh, Mick Mulvaney was there. He actually sat in the the court to hear this particular one. So, like I said, he used to be the acting director of the CFPB for a period of time. And then uh, down here, if you remember, where is it? Here it is. Uh, when Chief Justice John Roberts was wrapping up his presidential impeachment trial duties in the Senate last month, he made a point to invite senators to visit the court. By long tradition and in memory of the 135 years we sat in this building, we keep the front row of the gallery in our courtroom open for members of Congress who might want to drop by to see an argument or escape one, Robert said on February 5th. You may have heard that if you listened at the end of the impeachment scam, hoax, whatever. Since the court returned from its winter recess last week, no member of Congress has accepted the Chief Justice invitation. Or if they have, the marshal's office has not seated them in the middle front row bench referred to by Roberts. That bench sits empty during most arguments at the court, though there was an amusing moment a couple of years ago when a tourist tried to sit there. And it basically, this person kind of got separated from their group and thought, hey, there's an empty bench. Let's just sit there. And they had to redirect them. So anyway, but um, yeah, you can go through and read this. This is kind of like as you were listening to this, but um, I don't know. I, I liked listening to it myself. I prefer that because uh, that way I got to hear everything. I wanted to show you on these transcripts. Let me hang on at the end of the transcript. And I don't know, I think I saw this once before, but I, I don't remember. But I thought this was really interesting. Every word they said is in here. I don't know about the, I didn't look for that, but all these words are in here and they're listed as to when they were said, like page 61, line 23, page 23, line 11. So yeah, although they have although in there. So it has listed every time they said those. So if there's a certain word you're looking for, you just check out here. It's alphabetical. You can look up that, you know, Humphreys executor. They said Humphreys more than they said executor. Um, here's executor. They said it several times. And then Humphreys right here, Humphreys. So yeah, they said it many, many times. <laughs> And they talked about the FTC. Francisco is the Solicitor General for the United States. He's the guy that argues the cases for the United States uh, Department of Justice. So, but Gorsuch asked several questions. He didn't right away. Oh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg came out of the shoot fighting. So she was the first one to start out. She's not sounding so great if it is really her, but you know. <laughs> Uh, she has claimed, and I heard this a uh, while back, a few months ago, that she was going to wait until after her birthday to step down. Her birthday is March 15th. So I don't know if she's still planning on stepping down or if she's going to do the best she can to make it through to the election. I don't think it's going to matter, but um, yeah, she she probably knows that there's just no way he's not going to win. So, uh, and <laughs> she knows that once President Trump wins, then he'll be able to appoint somebody. 
But anyway, I just thought this was interesting that you could go through and see that. So just remember that I'm a teacher. I'm trying to give you tools because it's good to know for yourself where the tools are to find things. And I think probably for me, this has been the biggest thing about the movement with the 17th letter of the alphabet for me is that I've learned how to find things out about our government to go directly to the source so I can find it out for myself and not have to get it third hand or, you know, from somebody on the TV that's getting paid to put some other narrative out there. So um, I just wanted to leave that with you. I, I will put all the links down below. This one is probably the best for most of you to read because it does kind of put it more in common terms. But if you happen to like, oh, I wanted to show you that. I missed this. If you want to dig more on this, here you go. <laughs> okay. This tab has everything. When you go to this link, you will have all the different things about it, all the different articles that have been written, you know, the SCOTUS talk, SCOTUS blog type things. And so there's lots of them about this particular one. And then you can get down here and you can find all the proceedings and orders, the petition for a writ of certiorari filed. That's when they ask the certiorari is when they ask the court, the Supreme Court, if they will um, deal with it. Oh, there was even question about that. Well, why did you even bring it here? No, it, it just, it was a weird, weird argument. It really was. But anyway, so here are all these different, <laughs> the different briefs and things. If you really want to go through, if you're a legal person, here you go. That's everything you need. And it gives the whole history of what happened and how the it proceeded through the, the court system. So I will put that link down below as well. And you can look at that. It's pretty complete, so, um, you know, you'll have it all. And even here at the top, it's kind of nice. It gives you, there's the uh, the transcript and there's the audio, so you can just click there. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, it was such a fun day going through all that. No, it really was. I enjoy doing those things, but I do come away feeling a little stupid because... <laughs> I didn't know some of the stuff they were talking about. It just went over my head. It was like, okay, I will take your word for that one. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see y'all later. Bye.